Hello and welcome to everyone. Welcome to the Estonian Open Air Museum. My name is Eric and I will be your guide on today's tour. Next to me you can see a map of the territory of the museum, which spans more than 72 hectares or around 187 acres. The museum itself was founded on the 22nd of May 1957 and opened to the public in August of 1964. The museum has an aim of introducing to people the architecture, living conditions and lifestyles that people had starting from the 18th century up to the modern period. The museum's exhibition covers more than 80 separate buildings. These buildings include, for instance, farmhouses, but also social structures. And as of this very year, a Soviet-era apartment building from a kolkhoz, or a collective farm. Also, at various farms, you can find livestock, such as goats, sheep, rabbits, etc. And while moving throughout the museum, you might come across some wildlife here and there as well, as the woods here are home to deer, rabbits, foxes, and so on. Now in the museum, when visiting, you can also rent a bicycle, because given the size of the museum, it is quite useful to have a bicycle. You can leave your bags in bag storage, and also to make movement with children a little bit more easier, you can also rent a little wagon to transport some heavier goods and some smaller members of the family as well. Now if you're ready, grab your things, grab your children, and let's head on to our first farmstead. We have arrived at our first destination. This is Sassiyani Farmstead. It dates from the early 19th century, specifically from the era of serfdom. Serfdom was a form of slavery introduced into Estonia during the 13th century after foreign invasions had taken place here. Serfdom lasted until the 19th century, until in 1816 it was finally abolished in the province of Estonia. But during this era, Farms such as Sassiani had a very Spartan living style. There was not much luxury to be found here. The main buildings of the farm include the farmhouse itself, often referred to as a barn dwelling or a threshing house. Next to it, you can see a small hut that is the summer kitchen there between the trees. Then the next larger building is the barn where the animals were kept. In front of it, you can also see the well and moving a bit more to the left, you can see the vegetable garden and finally the storehouse where various goods and textiles were kept. The first thing you might notice when looking at the farmhouse is that it is a very large building and there's no chimney on top of that roof. In addition, the walls are low, the roof is very high, the windows are small, the doorways are small. All of this was with one intention, to keep as much heat inside the building as possible. Inside, the building is also divided into four separate parts. The first part, over here, with the window, is a small chamber mostly meant for storing different goods. In the summer, it might be used as a sleeping area, but only in the summer, as that chamber traditionally was not heated. The only room which was heated and could be used as a living area all throughout the year was the kiln room accessible through this door over here. As we move forwards, the next room that we will bypass is the threshing room. This was the main working area inside the barn dwelling, where grain was thrashed and also the horse was kept here at night as well. And finally, at the very end of the building is a small door leading to an area known as the chaff room. The chaff room was an area where chaff, where things left over from the threshing process, were put inside there and stored, typically meant to be used as animal feed, or when times were difficult, people might actually mix it into their own food as well. Here we can see the summer kitchen. The summer kitchen was located separate from the main dwelling, because during the summer, 
it was seen as inconvenient to heat the large furnace inside the kiln room and heat up the entire building. The summer kitchen was a location where food was prepared not just for the people, but for the livestock as well. It was also a location for various other farm works. The summer kitchen was used for various different farm works. This was also a place where chickens were plucked, textiles were dyed, soap was boiled. Mostly dirty work that no one wanted to do anywhere else in the yard. The summer kitchen was typically also kept as far away from the other buildings as possible, as this was an open fireplace and fires were a definite threat during an era when most buildings were still made from wood. But now, let's take a closer look at the barn. Here in the barn, you could often find different types of animals. You could find chickens, geese, cattle, also pigs, sheep, goats, though not the horse. The horse was typically kept in the threshing house. But next to the barn, we can also see the vegetable garden. The vegetable garden was a place where people grew crops in addition to growing grain out in the fields. Here, people would grow things such as lentils, buckwheat, beans, swedes, cabbages, etc. Though the staple of food for Estonians for over a thousand years was rye, specifically black rye bread. Here we have the storehouse, always easily recognizable by the fact that there are various small doors leading to different chambers and also the building itself is elevated from the ground so that air can go in underneath and ventilate these compartments. In the different rooms, you could store different things. The most important of which actually was right here. Here in this chamber, you can see some symbols carved above the doorway. This was the chamber where foodstuffs were kept. Grain, for instance, or salted meat, butter, sour milk. The symbols there are to keep away the devil and the evil eye, to protect the foodstuffs. The next chamber was meant for various farming tools and equipment. And finally, the last chamber was meant for textiles, for clothing, for linens, and very importantly for the women folk of the family, the dowry chests of the daughters of the family, which they would take with them once they got married. Women or specifically the younger women of the family, often slept in that chamber during the summer months to have at least some level of privacy. For our next stop, we'll be going inside the barn dwelling to see the interior architecture. But before we go there, you probably want to know what this hole is here for next to the door. These are cat holes. As mice and rats would always find their way into the storehouse, you wanted the cat to be able to get in after them. These were extremely important specifically for the textile chamber and even more importantly for the food chamber. I mentioned earlier that you can rent a bike when you come to the museum. I highly recommend this. All the roads here are navigable by bicycle. You can go up to all the farmsteads in the museum and given the fact that the, that the museum is more than 70 hectares or more than 180 acres in size, it really helps to get from point A to point B if you're using a bicycle. We are currently not inside Saisiani Farm, the farm we just previously saw from the outside. Instead, we are inside Rosta Farm. The reason we're inside this building is because the interior of this building has survived in a much better state. And the first thing you will likely notice when you enter this building is that it is quite dark in here. The windows and doors are quite small. This is because it was a way to keep as much heat inside the building as possible, but it also doesn't allow much natural light to enter the room. Next to me, we have this large stone structure. This is the furnace or the kiln. In fact, this entire room is often called the kiln room 
This was the only heated room inside the entire building. And this was very important during the winter months. During the winter, this was the only room where the family would live inside because it was heated. However, a few things should be noted. While the fire was made inside this portion of the furnace, it was not made to produce light. That's because, as you might notice, there is no chimney. There is no way for the smoke to immediately escape this room. Instead, the smoke comes into the kiln room and collects here. Because of this, when the furnace was being heated, almost no one was inside this room. Instead, people would be in other parts of the building or outside. One person would come and check to make certain that the building does not catch on fire, that the fire doesn't spread. However, people would come back inside once the fire had died down. The windows and doors were open as well, so the smoke would go out. And once most of the smoke had dissipated, the windows and doors were shut and the furnace would continue to radiate heat for several days afterwards. But how did people get light? Well, candles existed, of course, back in those days. But candles typically were made from sheep fat or beeswax, and this was rather expensive. For everyday purposes, people instead would use a splint, as you can see right here. The splint would usually be made from pine. Uh, pine has lots of resin inside it, which actually allowed it to burn quite well and also at an even pace. And the splint would be put inside a clip like this, usually at a roughly a 45 degree angle. And then it would be lit from one side. The fire produced here would actually be quite small. It wouldn't give off much natural light, but it was enough to actually allow people to perform some handicraft during the winter months. In this dim light, the women folk of the family would have to produce, repair, sew clothing for the rest of the family. And families could be quite big. It was not uncommon for a family to have 10 or more children back in those days. However, quite a few of these children would never reach adulthood, either because of malnutrition, famine, warfare, or epidemics. Quite a few of these children would die very young, many even before they reach the age of three years old. But very important for the function of the entire farm are these wooden beams you can see here behind me, located quite close to the ceiling. These were here to dry grain. Estonia is located quite far north in Europe. And because of this, our winters tend to be long and the summers short. Due to this, wheat is quite difficult to grow here. So rye has been for over a thousand years, the staple grain grown in Estonia. But even rye, doesn't dry completely during the short Estonian summers. This is dangerous because rye specifically is susceptible to a certain type of fungus. And if this fungus is consumed with rye bread, for instance, it can actually bring about ergot poisoning. It uh, creates a situation where someone might develop ergotism. Ergotism leads, for instance, to painful and dangerous spasms, cramps, and also to hallucinations. Ergot poisoning could even be fatal. So when rye was actually harvested in Estonia, it was bound together into tall sheaths of grain, and they were placed standing upright on these beams. And they would stay here in the warm, dry air of the kiln room, and also in the smoky air. The dry air would dry the grain, and the smoke would kill off any fungus developing on the grains. Grain dried like this could actually be held in storage for a very long time. Because of this, it was actually very lucrative to sell Estonian rye on the European market. However, the Estonian peasants, well, they didn't actually see much income from this. For roughly 600 years, from the early 1200s, to the early 1800s. Something called serfdom was imposed in Estonia. Serfdom was brought here during foreign invasions in the 13th century. Serfdom basically meant 
that the peasants were not free people. They belonged to landowners. The landowners, or manor lords, as they were often called, were typically of German descent here. And Estonians were the peasants. Now, serfdom also meant that the peasants who lived here didn't own anything. The building, the cattle, the livestock, the tools, nothing here belonged to the peasants. It all belonged to the landowners. And also, taxations were high. First and foremost, the main type of taxation was labor tax. For 300 days of the year, the peasants had to do work on the fields of the landowners, of the manor lords. For the rest of the days of the year, they could work on their own farmstead. But even on top of this, they still had to pay more taxes. Typically in grain, butter, milk, pork, eggs, wood, wool, linen, different resources. But speaking of taxation, grain was still, especially rye, was the most typical type of taxation because it could be held in storage for a long time, it didn't go off very easily, and lots of people would eat rye bread. Now, taking a closer look, for instance, over here, we have a typical table where people would be sat during dinner time. There are large bowls here. Typically, there will be one large bowl on the table and the entire family, which includes the 10 or more children quite often, would be gathered around the table. Every person would have their own spoon and they would reach into the communal bowl to actually eat their dinner. Quite often, it would be porridge, such as made from oats or barley, but at the head of the table would be set the head of the household. And the head of the household had the bread in his hand. He was the person who would divide the bread among the rest of the family. And bread was first and foremost handed out to those people who did difficult manual labor on the farm, those people who burnt the most calories. But this bread wasn't usually very tasty. It's not like bread you can buy these days in shops. Typically, the bread was dry. That's because dry bread lasted a lot longer. And also, when you eat dried bread, you have to chew on it for a lot longer. This means you have to take smaller bites, and actually it makes it easier to digest, and also ensures your body gets more calories from every bite that you take. And if this wasn't bad enough, that the bread was dry, well, it also had different things mixed into it, because usually you didn't use pure rye flour to make bread in those days. You would mix in birch leaves, sometimes bark from birch trees as well. You would also mix in maybe moss or something else. This was a way to make the bread last longer, though it didn't actually make it taste very good. Nor was it very nutritious, but it was just a way to create more a feeling of a full belly. If we now look to the other side over here, we can actually see a bed. Now, this bed over here is meant for several people. You could actually have, quite easily, four people inside this bed. But this wasn't enough for all of the family, as there were more than four people in the family. Other people, when the area was open, would actually sleep on these wooden beams suspended above the ground. Small children often would actually sleep on the benches near the corners of the room. And if there were no spaces left, some people also would have to sleep on the floor. The floor, as you can see, is made from large limestone slabs. Sometimes it was made from compacted earth or sand, but this floor never got warm, even when the furnace was being heated. It was always cold. And despite that fact, some people would sleep on the floor. Typically, these would be the oldest members of the family, those who can no longer perform manual labor on the farm. But people also went barefoot here as well, because footwear was very expensive, not easy to come by. Usually children didn't have any footwear at all. So they would always be barefoot when walking around on this cold floor. Bed clothes, bed linens were different in those days as well. You didn't really have mattresses. 
you would maybe put some bags of hay under yourself for a bit of extra comfort, or cover yourselves in some cloths or some furs. But modern day blankets, of course, and pillows did not really exist back then, or at least were unavailable to the peasantry back in those days. But now, let's take a closer look at the next room, the threshing room. We have now entered the threshing room. This was the most important room in the building, as the most important work was done in this room. And also, the most important animal was kept here as well, the horse. The horse of the family was never kept in the barn. The horse was the most valuable animal, the most valuable possession of all that the family had. Because with this horse, they would plow not just their own fields, but the fields of the manor lords as well. The horse was kept here because here he would be warmer and also because the family would be sleeping in the room where we just came from, from the kiln room. This was important because if horse thieves came in the night, the family had to be ready to come and protect their most cherished possession. And here there was at least some chance that they might hear thieves coming after their horse. The loss of a horse would be a catastrophe for the family because this meant they lost their only true animal of burden and they would need to start renting a horse from their neighbors, which often they could ill afford to do. But the most important work which was done here in this room was the threshing of grain after the harvest had taken place. Here, grain was beaten to separate the seeds of grain from the stalks. And thanks to this, uh, the grain could then be separated, placed into bags for storage, and taken into the storehouse. This was quite difficult backbreaking labor, which everyone in the family took part in. Thank you. Could you also show us how linen was produced? Yeah. Another very important uh, work that took place inside this room was the production of linen. Linen was a very difficult textile to work with. To produce it, you had to go through nine different steps. It was long, arduous, and often backbreaking work. But the textile itself was very important because with linen, you could make sacks for grain, you could weave rope from it, and also clothing for people to wear. The room itself, thanks to its size, was used for various events. Weddings would take place here, but also slightly more sad events would take place here as well, as we can see from the coffin located behind me. Mortality was very present back in those days. There were pandemics, there were waves of famine, there were wars, people died very often. There were just illnesses which often took young children from this world. Because of this, it was always common practice to have a coffin at the ready. The sending off of the loved one before the funeral itself always took place here on the farm at the home where the person had lived. And our next location, after all this hard work of threshing grain and of producing linen, we will be going to see two very important buildings, one of which was often used after a long, arduous day, either out in the fields or threshing grain. We're going to see a smithy and, of course, a sauna. We have arrived at Bulga Farmstead. The building right next to me is the smithy. As the more perceptive of you might notice already, this building is made from limestone and no mortar is used. It is completely dry stone and smithies like this, small smithies, 
were common on many farms in the old days, where the head of the household would repair or even if necessary, make the necessary equipment for the farm. This changed, however, at the turn of the 20th century. At that point, it became far more common for villages to have one large smithy where the villagers would go to get the goods which they needed. And it would have a professional specialized blacksmith working there. Now, regarding this smithy particularly, there's also a legend that Peter the Great himself visited this building when he was traveling from St. Petersburg to Tallinn in order to get new shoes for his horse. This farm used to be located right next to the highway heading from St. Petersburg to Tallinn. But now we will take a closer look at the most sacred building on any farm, the sauna. Now, as we head towards the sauna, you will notice when we get to the entrance, there are markings above the door. The sauna was a sacred building and to protect it from the evil eye, from evil spirits and the devil, people often put markings above the entryway. Saunas were so sacred, it was even common practice for people before entering to greet the spirit of the sauna. We have now arrived inside the sauna. The sauna was both a practical and a spiritual location for many people. It was a location where people gathered to cleanse their bodies and their souls. If you take a look at the walls, for instance, you might notice it gets very dark near the ceiling. This is because this was a smoke sauna. When it was heated, there was a big fire in this room, but there's no chimney smoke gathered inside. The door was kept open for it to get out, but it still blackened the timber near the ceiling. Once the fire had burned away, the door would be closed. So the room would start to heat up more from the heat coming from the stones of the furnace. And then it was just about ready for the main sauna tradition. Estonians call this vicht, in plural vihat. These were used in the sauna when the sauna was heated in order to, well, for the outsider, it might look like beat yourselves with them. The idea was that this would help relax the muscles and cleanse the skin. Also to purify the soul. These branches could come from various trees and plants, all of which had their own special properties. It could be oak leaves, it could be birch branches, it could even be juniper or something else. All of these branches had their own properties to heal specific ailments, whether they were of the body or of the soul. But why was this location so spiritually important? Well, for instance, over there, we can see some elevated benches. This is the location where actually people would sit inside the sauna when the sauna was active. However, the sauna was used for multiple different purposes. The reason why this is so important is this was also the place where women often would give birth. Women would give birth in the sauna. It's a small building which could easily be heated. Also, there was warm water available and it was away from the rest of the family. There was some privacy for this very special and magical but also delicate process. For many people, the sauna was also their end. When people died, their bodies were actually taken into the sauna and they were cleansed here. They were washed here before burial. It was the beginning and the end for very many people. There were many taboos when it came to visiting the sauna. You were not allowed to shout or raise your voice or to swear. You were not allowed to gossip or to insult anyone. You had to pay respect to the spirit of the sauna you had to greet them when you arrived and thank them when you left. The sauna was seen as a connecting point between this world and the next world. Because of this, people would often come here to have their fortune told or to try to look for visions of the future. It was seen as a magical location. It was also a location 
which because it was connected to the next world, it could also be dangerous. Because of this, you were not supposed to visit the sauna after sunset. You could only come when the sun was in the sky, because once the sun had set, the devil might come here looking for your soul. In addition, the sauna had many different traditions when you visited it, not simply in terms of greeting the spirits here, but very simply because when people came, they came as a group. They came here as a family. The entire family would come here at the same time, men and women, old and young, all of them completely naked for quite often. And they would have very many different sauna traditions here. This was a place to cleanse not just the body, but the soul as well. Because it was so closely linked to people's understanding of souls and spirits, it was even said that when the sauna was being heated, the person in charge of the heating process was not allowed to think any evil thoughts, only good thoughts. These were but a few traditions of the old Estonians. But before we go, I will show you one more very important tradition. This was to protect your soul if you did come to the sauna after dark. To understand this, please look at my feet. You would make a cross to stand on. Preferably, you would even make a circle around this cross. Standing in this symbol, your soul would be protected from the devil. But as we're already talking about mythology, beliefs, religion in general, faith. We will now go to another location to continue this topic. Our next stop will be Sutlepa Chapel. So let's go. We have now arrived at Sutlepa Chapel. Coming from our previous stop at the sauna, we talked about how many Estonians for a long time still clung to the old pagan beliefs and mythologies of their past. The fact is that for many Estonians, Christianity was not something that they would readily accept. And there were many reasons for this. Christianity was brought to this land by force, through warfare. It was spread here by the landed elite, by the German manor lords, who were from a different background, a different culture, and spoke a different language. Even within chapels and churches, where church ser services were held, very often the services were in German, not in Estonian. The fact that the religion was something new and alien, and also introduced using an alien language, it made it feel that it was different, it was something other, it wasn't something that belonged to the people who were here. The Germans tried greatly to make Christianity more acceptable to Estonians, to make it easier to go to church. For instance, often the German manor lords even built churches near crossroads and next to taverns, so it would be easier to go to church it was slow going. Even though most Estonians were baptized already in the 13th century, it was only by around the turn of the 19th century that most Estonians began to accept Christianity as their own religion. When we go inside, you will also notice that this chapel, though quite small, is also quite sparsely decorated. This is a Lutheran chapel. This right here is a chapel which was built quite a while ago, at the very end of the 17th century. The chapel is divided as most sacred buildings were back in those days. The altar is located in the east. I am currently sat on the southern side, which is where the men sat. The northern side was where the women would be seated. This chapel specifically comes from the western coast of Estonia, from a county called Lanema. On the coast of that county, it was very common to find many Swedish communities who had arrived in Estonia already during the 13th century. And because of the strong Swedish influence in this chapel, church services were often held in the Swedish language. Also, looking towards the altar, you will notice there are wreaths hung up near the ceiling. This chapel is in part built in memory of sailors who never returned home. And those wreaths are placed there because quite often their bodies 
were never returned to their loved ones. The chapel itself is also the oldest building located in the museum. It dates from 1699. And even though it has been refurbished and in part rebuilt over the centuries, it still has very many wonderful original pieces to it. From the door which we used to enter, and quite here next to me is also a beautiful authentic organ as well, often used within this chapel. We have arrived at Kuye Schoolhouse. This 19th century school shows how education took place during the Russian Empire and the early Estonian Republic. The school itself used to be a very strict location. There were many rules, many punishments, many regulations you had to follow. The curriculum was also very strict. During the era of Alexander III of Russia, school became compulsory for all children above the age of 10. Children would go to school for three years during the winter months, specifically from the 15th of October to the 15th of April. During the rest of the year, they would be at home doing farm work. But during the winter, they would come to school. Children also came here, both boys and girls, to learn a variety of different uh, classes. But we'll talk more about what these classes were, what were the punishments, the regulations, once we actually go inside. In the schoolhouse, our first destination will be the classroom. In classrooms like this, children had a very rounded education where they learned reading and writing, basic mathematics. They had physical education, they learned history and geography. Also, they learned to speak the Russian language. And also, they had Bible studies, as every child had to learn the Word of God and the text within the Bible. The church and the school were intrinsically linked to each other. Every school day began with a prayer, and every school day ended with a prayer. To make certain that the children were learning enough from the Bible, the church often sent laymen to the school to check if the children had learned enough from the Bible. It is also a very strict atmosphere here, as the schoolmaster had to keep discipline within the school. The children had to learn that when they were doing their work, they had to be standing with their back straight, they had to have their feet and their legs underneath the table, and their handwriting had to be good as well. There were various punishments for breaking rules, and also for just falling short. These punishments could be things such as detention, caning their fingers. Also, you might be put to kneel on dried peas, which you can believe is not a very pleasant situation to be in. Children often for writing would use a tablet and either chalk or a stylus. They would also sometimes use a quill, ink, and paper to write on. Their calligraphy was also judged very harshly. Now, as singing was also very important, this meant music also was important in the schools. This school comes well equipped with both an organ and also a harmonium as well. Now, within the school, you also needed to have a portrait of the ruler. As this school for a long time was still within the Russian Empire, the last ruler whose portrait was here is of Tsar Nicholas II, the last Tsar of Russia. The school also had various other rooms, not just the classroom. Because within this building, many people had to live for quite a while. Let's take a closer look at these other rooms. The other important rooms within the schoolhouse included, for instance, the kitchen. The schoolmaster lived in this building. He did not just teach here, he lived here. He also had vegetable gardens and some farmland around the building. 
but children also lived in this building during the winter months as many children came from farms which were so distant from the schoolhouse they couldn't go back home every evening. This kitchen here is already fitted with quite a modern furnace as well. And beyond the kitchen we have the living quarters of the schoolmaster located here in the next room. Many schoolmasters had to have a very rounded background because they had to teach a variety of skills to their students. Mathematics, geography, history, as mentioned earlier, and music as well. It was very much sought after that the schoolmaster would be able to play some instruments. They were not always able to, this wasn't always the case, but definitely when a schoolmaster was chosen, it was a plus in their favor. Schoolmasters also had one other very big advantage during the Russian Empire. As during the Russian Empire, they were exempt from military service. Whereas everyone else, for the most part, was eligible. And military service during the Russian Empire lasted for very many years. Many people were quite frightened of that prospect. Other rooms within the building include sleeping quarters for the children who came here as well. Our next location, however, is going to be a farmhouse which has seen a lot of change as it is from the early 20th century, a time of great change within Estonia and also the birth time of a very important republic. Since our last stop, a very big and important event has taken place. On the 24th of February 1918, Estonia declared independence. This began big changes in the country. For the first time in centuries, people now depended mostly on themselves, their own ingenuity, their own know-how, their own determination and skill to determine how well off they would be gone were the old class systems of the Russian Empire. This was now a new brave republic. Many Estonians quickly began mimicking the architecture of the more well-off Germans. For instance, here at the Kutsari Haryabea farm, you can see a pond over there. You can see a farmhouse as well. A farmhouse which looks very, very different from the previous barn dwellings we are used to, as this one has a veranda, this one has two floors, this one has large glass windows, gone is the old thatched roof as well. This building was a symbol of change in the country, a symbol that this country was developing in a new social order. And inside things changed very much as well. And this farm was built by the Orro family a family who became quite well off thanks to their own hard work. They never employed any servants. They did all of the work on their own. They owned much land. They had an orchard, lots of cattle. They even owned forest land as well. And they often went to the market in St. Petersburg to trade in milk, cream, butter, eggs, pork, flax and linen. This made them one of the most well off farms in northern Estonia. But when we go inside, we'll see how the interior has changed drastically as well. Being inside Kutsari Haryabra farm, you can notice that the interior here is like night and day compared to the interior we saw at Rosta farm earlier. Firstly, you will notice the much larger windows, which allow natural light to come in. The kitchen is far more spacious. The floors have wooden panelling on them, which means you no longer have to stand or walk on cold limestone slabs or compacted earthen floors. There's also a proper stove here to prepare food. And food is now very often prepared inside 
the farmhouse because now there's also a proper chimney to allow the smoke to immediately exit the room. If you were to stand inside here with me, you would notice you don't smell any smoke in the air, unlike in the previous barn dwellings. The ceiling is much higher, the doorways are much more spacious and more comfortable to pass through, and also there are multiple rooms located inside this building. Speaking of which, let's take a look at those other rooms. When we walk in here, you will notice we have wallpaper on the walls, colorful and bright. There's also much more furniture in here. You will notice there's a wardrobe. We also have a radio and a couch on the other side. And again, large windows to allow more light to actually enter this room. And as we walk to the other side, you'll also notice a proper bed is also inside this room. No longer did you have three, four, five people sharing one cramped small sleeping space, but you actually had a bed. Now, this bed, of course, was meant for two people. It is still smaller than the beds we might be used to these days, but it's a big advancement from the sleeping areas which people had centuries before. Now, the next room which we are going to enter, when we go inside, you will actually notice that over here we have the entrance to the veranda. Now, the veranda itself was actually a place which many Estonians didn't get to use very often. The veranda was mostly a way to mimic German country houses, which were quite popular in the Baltics back in those days. But most Estonian farmers didn't have the time to spend much time on the veranda to drink coffee or eat cake, but it was still necessary to have it, as it did show that the family was rather well-to-do. And this family here was quite well-to-do. This farm belonged to the Oro family, one of the richest families from northeastern Estonia in the early 20th century. You'll also notice a rather luxurious looking couch over here, a fine Persian rug as well. And as we head towards the next room, we'll also go past the piano. The piano was very expensive and this was another way for the family to show what it had achieved. The Oro family was very well-to-do, but mostly this uh, money came from their own hard work. The family worked very hard every year, but they never hired any servants to help them with their work, even though money-wise they could have actually allowed themselves this luxury. Instead, they worked on their own. Now, in the next room, also, we should point out that you may have noticed in many of the other rooms we passed through, we do actually have proper heating in each of the rooms. This means there is finally more than one bedroom. You can also find another bed next to us over here as well. This is important. This gives more privacy. And also the heating gives more comfort throughout the home and also allows many items of clothing to be kept inside the house, which previously had to be kept in the storehouse. Because now with the proper heating, you can also keep more moisture out of the building. But let's take a quick look back at the kitchen where we started. In the kitchen, you will notice that we have also many different spices, many different foodstuffs. This is important. Starting from the early 20th century, especially after Estonia gained independence in 1918, Estonians now had far more access to different foodstuffs, different spices as well. And this meant that there were many new recipes available which people had never tried before. It was very common for housewives to actually go and have uh, take special courses where they would learn different recipes and different ways of preparing food and serving food. But in addition to these new recipes, housewives also learned, for instance, how to preserve foods, how to prepare preserves, jams, pickles, etc. And coming over here into the pantry, you will actually notice 
it is quite well stocked. A well stocked pantry such as this was actually the pride of almost every housewife in Estonia during the early 1920s and 1930s. But let's take one more look outside as well. Another big change which took place during the early 20th century was a very big focus and emphasis on cleanliness and hygiene. Because of this, outhouses and different toilet facilities were built uh, in large numbers in the new farm places. In addition to this, there were also many pamphlets, books and articles published on how to best protect your house from and rid your house of different vermin and parasites. While some of the smaller pathways might be a little bit rough for riding on a bicycle, you can just step off and walk along them until you get to the next main road. Going up this pathway, you'll notice we're next to a creek, something which you can come across, across quite often here in the museum. And next to us, this large stone building, this is a water mill. This is Kahala water mill from the 19th century. And water mills are ancient technology for Estonians. We had water mills here already before the Christian invasions of the 13th century. In fact, just the Estonian word for water mill, or mill in general, veski, is derived from two Estonian words, vesi and kivi, or water and stone. Water, because it's a water mill, and stone for the millstones. That is where we got this word from. we have arrived at a crossroads. And chronologically, we're still in the early 20th century, still in the early Estonian Republic. At crossroads, you could typically find various important buildings. And one of these buildings you can see here right behind me. This here is a fire shed. Volunteer fire sheds like this one sprang up abundantly in the early 20th century. The main reason for this is that Estonia was and still is to a large extent a sparsely populated country, which means if a village somewhere out in the countryside needed help during a fire, then municipal fire stations typically were quite far away. They could not rely on them for help. They needed volunteer organizations for this. And volunteer firefighters were greatly respected and valued. If we take a closer look inside, we'll also see some of their equipment in here. On the left, you can see standing proudly in his parade uniform, Rudy. He is our volunteer firefighter. And volunteer firefighters all had their own parade uniforms. And also many charity events were organized for them because they required lots of equipment to do their work. But to purchase equipment and to maintain it, they needed funds and they often turned to their local communities for help. You can see various pumps as well, which were used to fight fires, and also some hoses hanging here as well near these pumps. The towers on fire stations were specifically used to dry these hoses, as if hoses remained humid, wet after being used, they could become moldy on the inside, or they might freeze during the winter months. Either way, those hoses would become unusable as a result. Volunteer firefighting organizations were also one of the very few organizations which actually were still permissible after the Soviet occupation after World War II. Another building which could be found near crossroads were village shops. These were very important. They began to spring up during the early 20th century. The one next to me actually dates from 1914. Now, we're not 100% sure if this building was dedicated, first of all, to actually be a village shop or if it was actually meant to be a place where people would live. 
but we do know that this actually functioned as a village shop for several decades. The first owner and builder of this was a man called Jan Meinberg. And the shop here functioned for a long time. It was very popular. It comes from the village of Lau in Estonia. And for many people, this was a place where they could get goods which were not actually accessible within their village. Things which the village could not produce on their own. Different types of textiles and footwear, buttons for clothing, also things such as, uh, for instance, petroleum, matches, chocolate, marzipan, sugar, sweets, salt, lemonade. But also, you could special order for yourself to this shop things such as radios, refrigerators, and sewing machines. On top of this, you could buy and post postcards from this location as well. For many people from the village of Lau, this shop, for instance, was the first location where they ever heard a radio broadcast in their life. Now, Jan Meinberg did not own this shop forever. It eventually passed to his wife when at one point he unfortunately, we're well not quite certain how, but unfortunately drank some acid and passed from this world. The shop then passed to his wife and to his wife's daughter. The two ladies ran this shop for a long time after that point. They lived in this building as well and also rented out one of the back rooms for a tailor. We have finally arrived at a building where we can talk about the near history and also the present era. Behind me is an apartment building from a kolkhoz, or an, a collective farm from the Soviet Union. This specific building dates from 1964, but thousands of buildings like this were built throughout Estonia during the 1960s. They were typically built with a purpose in mind. They were often built out in the countryside in rural areas where there were no other buildings like it in the surrounding area and they were meant to house, for instance, in this building, milkers or in other locations, people who were related to forestry or doctors, etc. Now, in this building, there are four apartments, each of which have three rooms. And each of these apartments is dedicated to a different time period from Estonian history. One talks about life during the 1960s, another during the 1970s. Another one talks about life during the 1990s, a very big era of change for Estonians as during that point Estonia regained its independence from the Soviet Union. And the final apartment talks about the year 2019. On the basement level you can also see an exhibition about life in rural Estonia from the middle of the 19th century up until the 21st century. Behind the building you can also find a combined garage slash sauna slash storehouse and also a milking station. And last but not least, the museum also has its own completely authentic tavern offering authentic Estonian food and drink. While the building itself might date from the very late 19th century, you can rest assured they will cater to your needs if you have intolerances, allergies or convictions which prevent you from consuming certain types of food. This has been our tour today. I truly hope that you enjoyed it and we hope to see you back here in the museum in person. While we talked about many topics, we only scratched the surface of what this museum truly has to offer.